Welcome to Senior Living Marketing Perspectives. I'm Debbie Howard from Senior Living Smart. And today I am chatting with John Gonzalez, and he is the Senior Vice President of Consulting and Managed Services for Haven Senior Investments. So welcome, John. Thank you. Good to be here. Oh, I'm excited to, to chat with you today. Um, for folks that you know may not be familiar with you, um, maybe you can share with us a little bit about you know your background in the industry and and your passion. And I know I know your passion is very much aligned with things that are going on in the industry today. So we'd love to learn a little bit more about you. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you. It's an honor to be talking with you today. And I think what you guys do is phenomenal. As a matter of fact, I wrote some notes down last night about some of your blog posts that I remembered reading, went back, and, and, and they're so timely today. But uh, to answer your question, yeah, I've been in this business for 34 years. So I started yeah. when I was two, which makes right. me 36 if you're doing math. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I started off waiting tables in an independent living community in Texas, uh, went into dining room management, kitchen management, uh, uh, eventually into marketing and sales. I was a VP of marketing and sales for a number of years before getting into a um, uh, COO position for about 12 years, started my own company for six and have recently joined with uh, Haven Senior uh, Investments. And it's just been a terrific ride. The, you know, I fell into the industry accidentally. Uh, I was fired from uh, waiting tables <laughs> at, a, <laughs> at a restaurant and uh, I wasn't a good waiter, but uh, the, I was looking for something. Uh, there was an ad in the paper for a dining room services uh, person for a retirement community. And this is before the term assisted living had even been coined. Uh, so I took the position and just wound up growing up with the industry. Um, you know, at some point, uh, early on in, in my walk with uh, uh, senior housing, um, it, it, the light went off. M my grandmother uh, passed from Alzheimer's disease uh, almost yeah. 38 years ago. And so we saw uh, that decline uh, firsthand, the impact on our family. Uh, it, at that point, there was nowhere else to put her except for a state-run nursing home. That's all, that's all my family could uh, find and afford. Um, and I hated going there. I hated to go visit uh, grandma and it, it was embarrassing and I felt shamed, but the sights, the smells, the sounds, they were just, and seeing grandma with no quality of life um, mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a time when she should be still thriving and learning and growing and you know, dancing and painting and these things, which she had the capability of doing, but there was just no option. So I knew there was a better way. And so through the industry, I feel like I've uh, been able to have some impact on the growth, the progression, and now beautiful communities that people have the option of, uh, of moving into. That's great. Well, thank you for sharing that story. I feel like we all have those kind of personal uh, personal stories that connect us to the industry. So um, today, I know we, we wanted to really schedule this time together um, to focus on a really a, a quite a crisis that we're undergoing. It used to be, you know, everyone would call us to say, can you get me more leads? We need more prospects in the pipeline. And I would say today we're getting as many calls for people who are turning to marketing to look for, I need to fill my pipeline of applicants and the same strategies that you're employing to help us, you know, attract, nurture and advance prospects through their decision cycle, you know, would they work on the staffing side? And how can we employ those those similar channels um, more creatively? Because, you know, the job fairs and the, you know, the things that we've always done in the past just really aren't aren't enough. So um, I know that that's really a passion project for you as well, kind of coaching and developing people and leadership development. So I'd love to know kind of, um, I think we were talking just before we hit hit play on the record uh, for this podcast that McKnight's today just published an article that 71% of assisted living providers 
are very concerned that workforce issues may uh, put them out of business. 71%, I almost fell out of my chair um, about that. So, um, and I know that's something that you, you've been, uh, you know, on LinkedIn, certainly posting about and, and really speaking about. So I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts about where we are, um, you know, what you're seeing, what are some of the strategies that might be working? Um, so I'll, I'll, let's start with that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it, it's, uh... It's a critical time in our industry right now, and uh, uh, the communities that have um, learned to pivot to this new environment uh, quickly uh, are the ones that that are doing well, or certainly better than a lot of others. The industry as a whole took a 10% drop in occupancy across the senior living spectrum and is only now starting to level out and start to pick up a little bit. Now, that's on average. There are some communities that did really well uh, in spite of the pandemic. Uh, I was uh, uh, fortunate enough to work with a community in uh, Pensacola, Florida, memory care building. And in the middle of the pandemic, um, they enlisted me to assist them with the declining occupancy. Uh, they had dropped to about 70%. And over the span of about 90 days, we were able to fill the building back up and create a waiting list because we pivoted quickly. And part of the pivoting is the messaging. So they had been very hospitality oriented and, you know, mm -hmm. hey, we're the country club of choice in the area, but you can also get services here. Interesting thing is they had such a strong background in clinical uh, expertise uh, that, that they weren't showcasing. And in the middle of the pandemic, that message was what was resonating with uh, adult children, finding mm -hmm. a safe place for mom. So we pivoted messaging. We focused, uh, like you guys do, on a lot of digital advertising, uh, on your presence in social media, what that message is that runs across those platforms. Is it cohesive, online reviews, and really put the message out there, uh, including things like virtual touring, because people aren't, weren't coming in. So simple things like, do we have a stabilizer for your smartphone when you're walking around the community? Because otherwise it feels like the Blair Witch Project because you, know, mm -hmm. you get bounced around on a tour. So that, that's a great example of a community that pivoted quickly. They adjusted their messaging and they rode out the storm and they're doing well. The interesting thing now where we find ourselves, all of those strategies still are sound and work so well. I think marketing and sales professionals as, a, a, as a, uh, an entity within senior housing is ahead of the curve from operations in that you guys have been in this world for a long time. You saw the wave coming uh, and those companies that were, were, were aware and, and, and looking forward saw, hey, we've got to pivot uh, maybe postcards and direct mail isn't the way to go now. Maybe we need to do a lot more things electronically and digitally. And one of the interesting things for me when we first talked was discussing how those same techniques being used by marketing and sales and having uh, been used for a long time, maybe that is an opportunity for us to approach employees. So I think the, the critical thing is the platform's probably already there. Um, the database is something you're going to have, uh, we're going to have to find uh, available employees, but the messaging is the most critical thing. Uh, I think if you have the right messaging, if you have a strong presence uh, online, they'll find you. So, but when they do, you've got to have the right message that's going to attract these folks to come to us. And that's something I think in general, senior living has always struggled with is the perception uh, oh, I don't want to work there. I don't want to work for the old folks and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so we have uh, a couple of issues going on. One is the perception uh, of the younger workforce in particular and uh, how we adjust that message and make working in senior living sexy, uh, mm -hmm. make it something that's interesting. And, and, and so I did some research and I found that this new generation of employees uh, are really looking for purpose in their life. And that's why you see a rise of younger folks involvement in uh, uh, the political arena and cultural uh, arenas, and they're getting involved because they want that purpose. So it's incumbent upon us to, to create that, or not even to create it, but to show what that purpose is. 
and to share with these folks, you know, that this isn't just a paycheck. This is, um, this is profound. It has meaning. And it's not just the residents, it's the family members that we're also serving. And mm -hmm. if we can articulate that and connect with that desire for purpose in their work life, I think we're going to be a lot more successful. And I think the, the way we get there is by utilizing much of the platforms that we've been using for marketing and sales for years. Yeah, I agree. We've had, um, we do, have been doing some of these projects for our clients and, you know, they're, they're getting really creative around even doing things like setting up a Facebook group for all of their associates and then saying, invite your friends because we have to give people a, an insight into, you know, how fun it is to work and the difference you're making and the interactions that you're having. And, you know, those channels that are more visual where you can post videos and, and pictures and um, even video, you know, test testimonials and things like that are, are certainly, you know, compelling. Anything that you're seeing out there that, that you think, you know, is, is innovative as people are pivoting to, towards this new, this new reality and this new way of, of attracting uh, talent? You know, what, what's interesting uh, is that the environment has not settled yet. So we're in the middle of the shift, right? And, and, you know, whether it's the pandemic, the lockdowns, uh, the drop in occupancy, and now uh, an intense problem with labor and staffing. So as an industry, um, I really feel strongly that we've got to readjust our expectations uh, financially for our communities. We've become so successful in, uh, with um, frontline staff that aren't really compensated well for what they do. And I was fortunate, and I, I know several of us, you, yourself probably included, to start at that ground floor and see uh, and find a career path. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of these folks, um, you know, they coming in and working for minimum wage when McDonald's will hire you for seventeen dollars an hour uh, it, it is is difficult, and mm -hmm. you already start off. Uh, flat-footed in terms of recruiting. So I think as an industry, we have to settle, um, we have to settle things down. We have to adjust our expectations. We need to be creative in how we, how we compensate for that um, additional uh, operating expense in the middle of having additional operating expenses because of the pandemic. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of pressure going on right now uh, and I'm working with a couple of different uh, groups uh, where the uh, minimum wage uh, is well below what the market is paying. So we have to make that adjustment. And of course, what that does is create a wage compression situation where you have folks that are making above minimum wage, seeing new folks coming in, making as much as they are. So now they are expecting some adjustments. So there's an entire very fluid situation going on and the operators that can pivot and that can um, uh, not only recruit, but retain good employees mm -hmm. are the ones that are going to weather the storm. You know, it's interesting. I see a lot of companies, a lot of businesses paying sign-on bonuses, uh, you know, starting at this with a sign-on yeah. bonus for that, which is great uh, and, and probably necessary, but uh, not a lot of them are giving bonuses to great employees to retain them. So I think, again, there needs to be a mind shift that, OK, it's yes, it's important to go out and get new employees. But holy smokes, we've got a building full of great employees. We need to do something for them to anchor them. Uh, I think those that have stayed in this space and worked in these communities, especially through the pandemic, those long term grade A employees, um, they, they need that recognition and it's mm -hmm. incumbent upon us to, to give it to them. Um, it, it's a difficult market out there. The, the other interesting thing for me is that some of the old is still new again. So the, the, the strategies for retention um, are still the same. You, you want to anchor people, you want to reward them, obviously. But uh, how do you anchor folks into your building? And I'm a huge believer that it's through genuine relationships that create those anchors for people, whether mm -hmm. it's uh, with other staff, with residents, uh, with, with the family members, uh, but fostering genuine relationships between your existing staff and those folks 
um, is, is the real key to anchoring folks to the building. It's not going to come because a dollar more an hour. It's not going to become, because, you know, we have pizza parties every Friday or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's going to come from those genuine relationships, having a best friend at the building uh, that you work with or for. You said uh, the Facebook page and mm -hmm. invite your friends to come and see what we do. It's a beautiful example of something that I think um, it, it's going to be effective. It is successful. You, you want your employees to be your best recruiters, but if they're not happy for whatever reason, uh, that's going to be a tough road. Um, and the distinction, it's interesting between marketing, sales, and operations. I always see that separation as toxic. Uh, we're part and parcel of the same goal. And mm -hmm. if as a marketing or sales professional, uh, you recognize that the operations are struggling because of the staffing issues, for instance, or the increased operating expenses. Um, the belief in the product is going to wane. Uh, you're, you're going to have difficulty conveying that passion and belief about your building if you know that there are issues operationally with the building. So I, I've always believed that they need operations, whether it's the executive director, the department heads, have to work in support of marketing and sales, just as marketing and sales needs to work in support of operations. We're all the same team. I always tell people that we all do the same thing. It doesn't matter what your title is. We serve residents. We serve this generation. And I think we've got to work on that kind of cohesion, uh, mm -hmm. not only at the, at the industry level, but right down in the individual communities. Uh, I've seen a lot of those communities where that separation exists. Oh, marketing and sales, they get to go have lunch. They get mm -hmm. to go out tootling around the community. Uh, and there's this um, separation. They don't feel a part of what she is, he or she is doing in, out in the community. So I think uh, breaching that and creating a link where they feel a part of the marketing and sales team, every staff member should be a marketer. Every one of them a marketing director should be comfortable introducing them to a prospect on a tour. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they should be equipped with those skills. Uh, and, you know, sales, I, I find this uh, very common, isn't, isn't just about money, right? It's about conveying a passion and a belief that you have in something in a way that makes that other person want that. You know, wow, he really sounds passionate about what he's doing. I had a, a housekeeper uh, when I first started uh, managing communities uh, who was just phenomenal and, and, and loved the residents and had genuine relationships with them. And without even realizing it, what I would do during a tour, I would make a beeline for wherever she was mm -hmm. and with, my, with the, the prospects. And I would introduce her. Uh, Maria, uh, this is Mr. and Mrs. Jones. They're looking for a place for their mom. Why don't you tell them what you do here? And Maria would just go off and say, oh my gosh, I lost my grandparents uh, six years ago. But now I feel like I have 80 sets of grandparents because I have so much in common with Mrs. So-and-so and we're trade recipes with Mrs. So-and-so. And I just feel like we're all family and I just love working here. And I, oh, I have to tell you the story about uh, Mr. Phillips and his birthday and blah, blah. And she just would go on and I would just let her talk. Uh, she would finish and say, I, I, I'm sorry, I need to go now or say, thank you very much, Maria. She would leave. And I remember thinking, I just need to turn around now and say, should we go sign the lease now? <laughs> because, yeah. And I, I can't tell you how many folks said, can Maria be my mom's housekeeper? Mm -hmm. And isn't that interesting? A frontline staff member that was able to convey that belief and that passion in what she did and convey those genuine relationships uh, was probably my best salesperson. Yeah. Um, so, and that, that should be true for every community. You should have those people within your community that are your best salespeople. Yeah. So finding more of those Marias, you know, I think the, mm -hmm. the industry really, you know, if we take a uh, kind of a chapter from the, the hierarchy of needs, uh, you know, concept, you know, up to from, you know, very basic the very basic needs that people have or, or our team members have up to self-actualization and really looking at all of those steps. You know, I think that the industry has been stuck on stage number one, which is just survival. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that was really like, I give them a paycheck. 
but we haven't worked our way up to belonging and feeling like you're part of something bigger and be having an opportunity to grow and contribute. And then finally getting to that self-actualization of that, that, that sense of purposefulness. Um, you know, there have been enough workers that we were able just to stay on step number one of the hierarchy of needs which is just, you know, food, water, bed, sleep, shelter, all of that stuff. And we thought, you know, maybe that, that, that was enough. And yeah, we can, we can throw the pizza party and then we'll have the, the December, you know, associate gathering and hand out, you know, some resident, uh, you know, bonuses or whatever that is. But now we have to be just so much more creative because people are looking for more. Uh, You know, as we take a look at, um, as we're interviewing, we start off with understanding who is your ideal, um, like caregiver. So if we're hiring for caregivers, and we're doing a marketing campaign to attract and create a pipeline of opportunity for caregivers, the best ones are probably working. They're not the ones that are unemployed. They're not the ones who can start tomorrow. Um, And so what what we will do is we will interview um, their idea, their favorite workers, all the Marias that work in their communities. And we ask them, you know, how did you find this, this company? Why did you choose them? What, what attracted you? Why do you stay? Um, What are the things that make it a a great place to work? Um, And, you know, we're hearing, you know, things like, uh, you know, like training, like people are really, they want to grow. They want to have an opportunity. Uh, so there are certain things, like if you start with creating a persona by interviewing the, the folks that are doing a great job and have been with you for a long time and have been so successful, then it's about how do we go find more people like Maria, not just a warm body that's available that we can throw in tomorrow. So maybe you can talk a, a little bit about your thoughts around kind of, we do have short-term needs. We do have open positions. You know, we have a client who says, I have 300 open positions today. Okay. That's scary. And so we, you know, we have to have short-term solutions. Um, But then we can't just stay in this firefight of, you you know, you're going to have 300 next month too, if you're not focusing on training, development, orientation, onboarding, is having that sense of family and, and giving people opportunities. So, um, you know, we're trying to work the, the two paths together. Yes, we can do things that are that are short term, but just as important is how do we create a pipeline and how do we start attracting people who aren't looking for a job, who probably are the best long term employees? Um, and, and how do we start that? So I'd love for you to, to share kind of your thoughts uh, around those two tracks. Sure, absolutely. So you touched on a couple of really great points. The, uh, the, the idea and the approach of value add for um, existing employees. And I think when we talk about the, the scenario where someone has 300 uh, available positions, uh, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it, like you said, it's frightening. And mm-hmm. how do you deal with that? Because even if you fill those slots, you may have 300 next uh, next month. The way, um, what I would say is first, do no harm. Uh, you, you have to anchor existing good employees first. The cost of turnover is astronomical. Mm-hmm. And folks say, oh, we can't afford to give everyone a bonus or we can't afford to give everyone a $2 uh, an hour increase. But if you measure the cost of the turnover, it's exponentially higher than those costs. Right. So you got to start there with uh, anchoring your great employees. And uh, another way, it's not just money. Like you said, there's training mm-hmm. and development. You have to bring that to the table. Um, there's value add features. Uh, can we partner with a daycare or bring daycare into the building? Uh, is there an opportunity to create a program where, gosh, Donna worked a double shift and she's going back home to her family now, but we want to give her dinner and dinner for her family. And, and those kinds of things that really make um, the, help the employees to feel more like a family that, hey, they care mm-hmm. about what's going on in my world, uh, not just getting that shift covered, right? So the, 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 um, it, one of the value adds I love, and, and I think um, it's so applicable, not only in the workplace, but also to uh, personal lives is training folks on emotional intelligence. Uh, it, not only does it help 
create those relationships that we were talking about at, at, at the workplace. But that's a, a skill that uh, when applied to your personal life is, it, it is so valuable. And I, mm-hmm. it's funny, I was teaching uh, or tra- doing a training session a number of years ago. There were probably 80 or 90 nurses in this room and I have no clinical experience. So I'm, I'm very intimidated mm-hmm. and I go up to do my little spiel and I asked how, how many of you have ever had training on emotional intelligence? And out of that group, four people, I counted four hands. And I said, okay, how many of you have ever encountered a, emotion in, the, in your daily job? And of course, every hand goes up. Mm-hmm. Our, our staff uh, are dealing with um, grief and depression. Um, they're dealing w- w- with the, uh, the, the all of the baggage that comes along from uh, uh, mom aging, maybe having cognitive impairment, certainly being frail and our residents that are going through traumatic, well, many of them traumatic situations, loss of a spouse, serious decline in health. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes the, here's a good example. The daughter comes in, is furious that mom uh, missed lunch because that's what mom said, whether or not it's true, mm-hmm. uh, and starts berating someone, one of the employees, maybe it's a dining room staff member, a caregiver, or an executive director. And that, you know, when someone's coming at you like that, and there's not, I'm guessing, not a single person in our business that doesn't understand this situation, they're upset, they're angry, maybe they're acting on correct information, maybe not, but you're the recipient of that emotion. So understanding where that uh, where that attack is coming from, and understanding your natural response to it, and s- just pausing and thinking about that, uh, and then adjusting your response uh, based on the skills that we're able to to impart to the employees is magnificent, and it it does help in the workplace. But I started teaching this a number of years ago, and I remember thinking, I'm going to start doing this at home. <laughs> and mm-hmm. because, you know, who, what family doesn't have these arguments from time to time, whether it's with your kids or your spouse or what. So I started to, to do it and it really um, changed my, the dynamic in our home. And a, one quick example, I, I had an awful day at work. Um, I was driving home in rush hour traffic. My AC stopped working. It was <laughs> middle of summer and I uh, had skipped lunch because I had to work through it and got home, recognized that I hadn't mowed the grass yet. And I'm getting ready to jump on a plane at five in the morning. And so I'm going to come back 10 days later. And it's going to be awful. Um, so my hand hits the doorknob and I'm thinking right away, how is this interaction going to go with my family? My small son's going to run up to me and want to play. My daughter, my you know, wife. I actually did. This is true. I walked in and and she hadn't had time to make dinner because she was busy reorganizing the pantry. And and my initial emotional reaction is, wow, come on, guys, let's get going. No dinner now. I have to go pick up my dry cleaning before I, I can't play right now, Andrew. It, you know that's mm-hmm. how I wanted to come across. But when my hand hit the doorknob, I stopped and thought about this, and I walked in and I thought, you know, instead of sucking those folks, my family, into my life, into my story today, I want to be in their story. And I started to practice this, that I would walk in not feeling like a good dad, not feeling like a great, I just angry and frustrated. Mm-hmm. And when my boy came up to me, I said, you know what? Dad's got to go on a trip tomorrow, but why don't you come upstairs? You can pick all my ties and socks out for me. And we'll just play mm-hmm. basketball, shoot him into the uh, suitcase. And so I started to act that way. Hey, no problem. Dinner's not ready. Let's order pizza. And we haven't had pizza in a while. And I started mm-hmm. to just act that way. What I noticed is the more I acted that way, the more I felt that way. And mm-hmm. I think if you can teach that to employees, um, I think it's a skill, life skill, right? And, mm-hmm. and there's so many opportunities to impart those life skills to the employees and those value adds, smoking cessation programs and, uh, you know, uh, weight loss programs or cholesterol lowering programs. There's so many things that we can do and we have to be creative in order to retain those good employees. And I think by doing that, you do create a bit of a pipeline because others want to be a part of that. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. I really love the idea of starting off by anchoring your the employees that you have. Um, and then from that, you can really elicit, 
you know, you know, referrals and testimonials and, uh, you know, there's so many, you know, good things that, that can attract other good people because, you know, people want to work with good people. They want to work with people who are going to show up and be good teammates. And, um, you know, some of the things that we've seen um, around anchoring, which I think is really interesting, is one of our clients, uh, they're designing new buildings. You know how usually the staff break room is like in the basement with no windows or is by the loading dock. I mean, it's not right. a desirable place that says, we love you. We care about you. You're special. It's like, here's the leftover non-revenue generating <laughs> space that we could give you. <laughs> right. So yeah. they're, they're actually in their new buildings. They're putting the uh, employee lounge right upstairs, right in front, all windows, charging stations, uh, you know, all kinds of, you know, fun things when they take a break, it's comfortable, it's bright, it's respectful, you want to kind of hang out there, um, you know, and, and, I, and there's, you know, full showers, because some people work double mm-hmm. shifts. Right. Um, and then they're also uh, telling all the employees, look, all of the amenities that are in this building, they're for you. And mm-hmm. they're for your family. So if you want to come play pool or watch a movie or bring your kids to swim in the, in, you know, in the pool or take your dog on the walking paths or dog park or whatever it is, this is your home too. And they believe that, you know, the more integrated, uh, you know, the residents are with the team, you know, it, everybody wins in that type of environment. And I just think that's absolutely brilliant strategy because who wouldn't want to be treated like that? And I moved my mom into a senior community a couple months ago. Her, her best relationships are with the staff. She knows all their stories. She knows who they're dating. She knows what they're cooking. She knows when their birthdays are. Would you pick me up a card? Am I allowed to give them a gift? She has better relationships with the staff than she does with other residents who just kind of annoy her. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, but she loves, you know, they remind her of her grandchildren and everything else, but she loves them. Uh, so I think integrating those relationships um, is a is really an, an innovation that I was so excited to hear that they were doing that. I think that's yeah, absolutely spot on. Exactly what, what what we're talking about in terms of how do you create or foster those great relationships? How do you nurture them? And I think that approach is brilliant. Uh, you touched yeah. on something right before that, which is the employee break room. I couldn't agree with you more. I, I and I don't know what the percentage is, but. I'm sure there's a high percentage of folks that have it right next to the laundry room or the bathroom or the pipes. Right. Right I've seen yeah. those. I've, mm-hmm. I've been in those and they're they're still out there. And I think, you know, people look at these types of spaces as non-revenue producing, but what they are is revenue retention, right? It, it, you yeah. don't want the turnover. You want to anchor your staff. You want someone to be willing to work the double shift. Because they know they can take a shower, have a bath, or sorry, a shower, maybe have a nap, uh, ha- have a snack in the break room. Uh, and maybe there's a mas- massage chair in there too for the sore back or the sore neck. There's so many mm-hmm. things that we can do, but we look at this space. And again, this kind of goes back to where we started, where I started about needing to rethink uh, as an industry um, uh, what our expectations are of the, our buildings financially. We're looking at this space as revenue producing. And if we make it an employee break room, we lose. Well, mm-hmm. I think we need to readjust that line of thinking. And your, your point about having residents and staff interact is actually spot on. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I love to do is find out what the employees are interested in. What are their hobbies? Are they musician? Are they, do they like to paint? Uh, whatever that is, and have them come in and do that here. Uh, mm-hmm. Oh, you know, my, I have choir practice. Why don't you have them come over here and practice? So why don't you, you know, bring your guitar over and play for the residents? Uh, it, you're, you love technology. How about showing the residents how to use their iPhones? Teach them some tricks, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, yeah. and, and, and really get them going. I, I remember doing that at one building and got to a place where we really didn't need more volunteers. <laughs> we had staff yeah. so engaged, e- even to the extent where, you know, uh, we had one staff member would come in frequently with his son and teach the residents how to use the Wii. You know, s- yeah. Something simple, mm-hmm. but back in the day, it was kind of a frightening thing. 
and yeah. and they just would come almost every other night they would spend a couple hours after dinner and sometimes they would bring mom sometimes but they were so involved and had created mm-hmm. those genuine relationships doing something that they loved they they loved playing the Wii on the giant screen and the yeah. kid the, the son loved it so yeah th- those kinds of things are fantastic I, you know i did that for a while uh, I got in trouble, though, when I found out one of the employees was a tattoo artist and I brought them in, but that was frowned upon. So yeah. uh, <laughs> you have to be careful. <laughs> you have to be a little careful, a little, a little discerning. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, that goes to the, the relationship between, you know, marketing and operations. You know, sometimes operators are like, you've got to go out and, you know, get us, uh, you know, applicants. We have all these open positions. But you have to deliver an employee experience. You know, exactly. That's really up to operations. It can't be smoke and mirrors. I mean, you can't tell people come to work here because, you know, we respect you and we care about you and we're like family and we're going to treat you well. And then our first day of work, they go to a windowless break room um, that's just dank and dark and awful. You're not going to retain them. So, right. yes, marketing, uh, you know, can can get the leads to the door and, and get people interested and, you know, even convert them to, um, you know, job fairs and to interviews and to, you know, uploading applications and resumes, all of that stuff marketing can do. But if operations doesn't yeah. actually deliver it, right. then you're going to find significant turnover in the first week, 30 days. And I think it's important that people track you know, not only turnover in general terms, and we, we, every year we turn over 50% of our, our folks. I've never seen a PL statement, you know, I've never seen anybody in a budget meeting say, hey, you know what we have to put in here? We've got a budget for 50% turnover. We know what's going to happen, but I have right. never seen it as a line item in any yeah. budget meeting that I was right. ever in, right? No, no, no one wants to acknowledge, <laughs> yeah, that's the reality, you're right. It's like, if we put it down here, it's going to happen. No, it, it's going to happen anyway, but yeah. I think you have to dig further and you have to figure out how many people quit a week after orientation. What's the turnover in the first 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, um, six months? Because we know if we can get them past 30 days, we can probably get them to 90. And if we can get them to 90, we can get them to six months. If we get them to six months, we can get them to a year. Um, but, you know, really mapping that out, we, we did this for one of our clients. Um, uh, you, you may know Vitality uh, Living, Chris Gay at Vitality. When he was first starting out, um, he had two communities and they, they were acquisitions. And so nobody knew Vitality. And everyone knows Vitality now because they're a great company and a great brand. But in his first two acquisitions, you know, he was like, hey, Deb, you know, we're going to have these two two buildings, we're we're a new player, how can we build trust with the employees? Because, you know, in an acquisition, there's a lot of nervousness. Am I going to like, who are these people? Are my benefits going to change? Are my insurance going to change? You know, all of those types of things. So we actually put together, um, first of all, a welcome box. So we created a Vitality blend. It was beautiful. On the outside of the box, it was all branded for Vitality. And we actually shipped to their home addresses this beautiful box, uh, it had their shirt, it had their name badge, it had, um, you know, a travel mug, it had chargers, uh, and it had a letter from Chris saying how excited he was, you know, to have them as part of the Vitality team. And, you know, all of a sudden we saw on Facebook, people were taking pictures of these boxes, taking pictures of their family, like looking or having their shirt or putting their name badge on. So it's like, how do we create a sense of belonging before day one? Like, why are we waiting until, like, I wonder if they're going to show up for orientation. And then if they do, let's go stick them in a room with a bunch of tapes and a bunch of videos, because that's a great experience, right? Yeah. Um, Yeah. But if you can, you know, beforehand have a strategy and, and have a, you know, something in place where we know that as soon as you can sign that, that job offer, we're going to put this wonderful, beautiful welcome kit in the mail to you and your family, then you're establishing, you know, great, uh, a sense of belonging and, and, and you can create the foundation for loyalty before they even start. And then what's their experience going to be for orientation? Are they going to get a beautiful binder where they can put their notes? Are they going to get their name badge? Are they, we even gave them each 25 business cards. The dishwasher's got business cards. The waiter's got business cards because it said, I respect you. You're a professional. When you work for Vitality, you're a professional. And people never had business cards before. (laughs) 
in those positions, only managers at them. Right, right. It's brilliant. And it's a great, it's a great recruitment and retention tool, right? Yeah. You're out talking with one of your friends and, oh yeah, my sister's looking for something. Well, well here, why don't you call, <laughs> call this number? That's my card. Yeah. That's amazing. And, and, yeah. and they're small things, right? They're, they're lower, no cost things that have big impact. And I think yep. that example with vitality is uh, perfect. It, you said something uh, just a minute ago about needing to deliver, you know, marketing and sales can go out and, and, and drive folks to the community. But th- on the other side, we have to deliver, right? Operations has yeah. got to deliver. The break room has to be somewhat decent. And you have to have these things in place. And uh, it's no different than marketing and sales going out and bringing a resident in. We've got to deliver now, you you know, marketing and sales professionals are tasked with selling this product and this service. And um, the most effective folks are just passionate about what's going on in the building and they want people to come and experience it. If we're not delivering on the back end, whether it's for a resident or an employee, turnover happens, right? And that's why I'm a huge proponent that marketing, sales, operations is is integrated. It has to be thought of that way. So mm-hmm. if there's issues with occupancy uh, and there's more pressure there, uh, maybe it's because of the COVID pandemic. Operations had better be supportive and helping. Hey, why don't we get you a handheld camera so you can do virtual tours? Why don't we do X, Y, and Z for you? In the same way, I think marketing and sales and the tools that at, at the disposal of our sales professionals can be used um, for employee recruitment. And yeah. in either case, we have to deliver. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, I think those things, um, you know, are really important. I think having, you know, career ladders because people want to grow um, in, in outlining your training program. So, you know, as we look at opportunities to attract, nurture and advance people through an employment decision, which is a big life decision. It's really about employing those same channels, right? So we have, we we run paid digital ads. Mm -hmm. We run Mm -hmm. Facebook ads. (laughs) We have, uh, you know, lead nurturing. We have marketing automation. So when someone engages and maybe downloads the benefit guide or, um, you know, creating content that that people who are looking to advance their career will find valuable, you know, how to interview well, questions to ask, here's our career ladder. Uh, and we capture their contact information in exchange for those valuable guides and ebooks and checklists and tools. You know, then we can nurture them and really bring them brand awareness um, and try to advance them to an interview and uh, an uploading of an application. Uh, so it really, it really is no different. It's just putting as much value on an employee as you do on a new resident. Um, because I mean, honestly, I think providers may get to a point where they have to cap occupancy based on the number of you know, FTEs that they have to care for them. And uh, that would be a very unfortunate thing to be able to say, we can't accept any more move-ins, you know, because we can't get the staff. Um, We actually had a restaurant near near us, our favorite restaurant. Like we live in Cape Cod, which is obviously very seasonal, right? And they they had a restaurant that wasn't on the water and, you know, wasn't, it was was kind of, you know, more of a local place. They had to shut down for the summer because, they couldn't get any staff because the staff was all over in the summer places because they were hip hop happening. And they were literally like, we're still paying rest, you know, rent on this restaurant. We have all of our expenses, but we do not have enough staff to open. And, you know, I looked at that and I said, gosh, I hope senior living doesn't get to the point where, you know, we reach 80% occupancy. We have the leads now. We have people who are, who now are wanting to move in. We have a pipeline of residents, but we don't have a pipeline of applicants to serve those residents. That would be a very, very bad situation. Yeah. And, you, you know, I think we need to learn the lesson uh, of what's going on now with other industries. I think restaurants are a great example. Uh, you don't have the people, you can't provide the service, you can't have a business, you know, right? And, you know, you hear it all the time. I see on my newsfeed frequently, uh, either hospitals are having to close and limit elective procedures again. And this right. time it's not due to the COVID outbreak. Now it's due to labor shortage, staffing shortages. Right. So it, it, it's hypercritical. The retention has 
move to the top of the list in terms of first steps, right? So mm -hmm. I talked to someone about, you know, how do I recruit more people? I said, well, what's your turnover rate like? And why did they leave? And why did this person leave? And yeah. one of the interesting things that I was hearing uh, right after the first of the year was some of the best employees that our executive directors had were leaving because of burnout. They were just exhausted. They had been the best employees working those doubles, taking care yeah. of the residents in the middle of the pandemic. And they got to the point where we could all kind of breathe a little bit and mm -hmm. they were just burnt, right? And, yeah. and they were looking for help. And the executive directors I spoke to were functioning as counselors. Uh, they were mm -hmm. listening to the employees that, that were still having that anxiety about what they went through that were just burnt out emotionally from what mm -hmm. they had been through. And wouldn't it have been a great idea to bring in someone to offer that to the sure. employees instead of losing them? And right. that's what unfortunately happened to, to a few of them. And, you know, it was one of your uh, blog posts recently talked about is is direct mail, is it still useful? Does it have purpose? And mm -hmm. I'm sitting here talking with you thinking, you know what, what if we did a direct mail postcard to a college campus or a college dorm and we promoted our flexible hours, hey, make money in your free time. And right. the, the same blog indicated, that I can't remember the percentage of people that actually still look at those. I do. <laughs> you know, I <laughs> yeah. go out, you know, maybe it's not every day. It's usually about every other day. And I get all the mail. And before I throw it, right, I'm looking at it. And if it's something that catches my attention, I'll set it aside. And mm -hmm. if it's something that, wow, yeah, I could use some extra money. I have flexible time. Uh, and there's a website I can just go to and, and get engaged. And then once you engage them, um, you know, you're off and yeah. running. So I, I think yeah. I, uh, I loved that blog post. I think there's still <laughs> value. There is value. Kind of and, you know, I, and also, John, I don't think people understand that you can actually get lists. Um, that are very specific. So like every state re retains a list of like certified nurses aides mm -hmm. or med techs. Mm -hmm. um, you can get them, you can purchase a mailing list of, you know, LPNs and RNs. So you can get a pretty targeted um, list, you know, to go after. And then, like you said, if it's a compelling offer and, you know, the, the pandemic has brought back QR codes in a big way. Yeah. So a postcard is a great use for that. I mean, if you link that QR code to your benefits mm -hmm. or your training program or a video of, of employees saying how, how they love working there, um, you can really integrate, uh, you know, a traditional marketing approach, like a, you know, a direct mail piece and turn it into a digital uh, interaction, which I, I think is yeah. is um, is really so interesting. We also found one of our clients that we uh, it, we interviewed um, all of their kind of best people, and one of the questions we asked, which I think is important for everyone to ask, is where were you working before you came here? And in their situation, a significant amount came from a warehouse. We think it's probably an Amazon warehouse. Um, you know, they just were near kind of a big Amazon warehouse. And you think about that people going in, it's a long day, it's physical, it's rote and repetitive, right. there's no purpose, there's no fulfillment. And we asked, why did you choose this? And it was because they wanted something that was more meaningful. Mm -hmm. And they also wanted to uh, better themselves and the training was really important. So now one of the things that we'll be doing is geofencing that warehouse or all of those warehouses. So when people come to work, they get served up an ad about, mm. you know, a career at this community with, you know, this kind of training program. So I just think we have to get innovative. We have to get, uh, we have to pivot. We have to embrace, you know, new ways of, of, of doing things. Mm. Um, so and I think marketing has, has a lot to offer uh, to people who are looking to, um, you know, really change a, a, the, the way that they look at attracting uh, new talent. So, um, so John, if people wanted to learn more about you, they wanted to connect and, and hear about what you're doing, or they wanted to learn more about um, Haven Senior Investments, what's the best way for them to, to reach you and find you? Sure. Well, if, if they send me their email, send them out a postcard. So <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> there you go. Uh, <laughs> No, it's, it's I'm more apt to read a junk piece of mail than I am a junk mail on my computer. And I don't know why okay. that is, but I'll see the tie. I don't know that person. Delete, delete, delete. I get the yeah. postcard and go, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, havenseniorinvestments.com. And from there, they can find links to all different, uh, all of our different services. 
uh, including how to get in contact with me. And, and I just love making connections in this business and hanging on to them. If we don't practice what we preach, I love retention. <laughs> so yes. I'm all about, you know, I made this connection and I'm going to send an email to them and talk to them. So, uh, but that's a great way to connect. And uh, like I said, I'm always, uh, I'm always open for a new relationship, a new connection. That's great. And I know you're very active on LinkedIn because I read your all your posts and uh, you're so good at responding and kind of keeping the conversation going. Uh, really appreciate your contribution to the industry. We'll have all your contact information in the show notes. And John, it was such a pleasure to visit with you today. Same here, Debbie. I really appreciate it. Thank you so Take much. Take care. <laughs> you too.